you, I believe God is. And we're all singing the songs together. And we're all praying the prayers together. We're all turning to the same scripture in the Bible when we read a text to preach. So everybody, yeah, we, we believe that God is. Then we get away from the friendly confines of the church. And the people that share like precious faith with us get out of sight. We're not singing the songs anymore together. We're not praying the prayers together. We're not looking at the same scripture together. Life happens. Situations come up that we sure, certainly thought would never happen. And we begin to find the enemy telling us, see, God doesn't really exist. Or if he does, he's so far away and he's so disinterested in anything that has to do with you that uh, he just as well not exists for you. It's a battleground for us to begin to say that I believe that God is. I believe that God is real. I believe it's who he I believe that God is who the Bible says he is. I believe he's as close and as involved with my life as the Bible teaches me that he is. I believe that God is. And when that battle has been won, then we come to the next one, which is we must believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And again, I would say to you that we get together in church and we'd all go, oh, yeah, we believe God rewards those that diligent because we're all sitting together. We're all on the same page. We've all been singing out of the, I started to say the same, the same hymn, though that's a long time ago. We're all singing off the same wall. We're praying prayers together. We turn to the same place, read the scripture together. So now we all say, oh yeah, I believe God diligently, uh, God rewards those who diligently seek him. But I want to tell you, what you believe dictates what you do. If you, you can say, I believe that Jesus will reward me if I diligently seek him. But if we really believe that, it will cause us to seek him diligently. You can say you believe it, but if you're not seeking him diligently, that is an indication that it's only a mental concept and in your heart you have not really believed that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Really. And so um, I want to assure you that according to the truth of the word he is. What we believe will dictate what we do. If we believe that God rewards those who diligently seek him, it will cause us to seek him diligently. Now, here are three ways. The book of Matthew, chapter number 6, tells us that we seek God. First of all, we seek God by doing charitable works, or we give. And Jesus teaches in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Do not be given, do not be doing a charitable deed to be seen by men. Because if that's why you give, you have received your reward already. But you do it secretly. And God who sees you do it secretly will reward you publicly. That's what the Bible says. I said that is what the Bible says. If we give to honor God, do it secretly, not to be receiving praise from men, God will see you do it. And God will reward you. Then the next thing that the sixth chapter of Matthew says is, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites that like to go out in public and make long prayers in public places, but instead, when you, when you pray, Go into the secret chamber and close the door. You pray privately. And he that sees you pray privately, your father will reward you openly. Look at there. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him privately. If you do it to be seen of men, they see you pray, you've got your reward. They think, well, there's a real prayer warrior. But the person that does it secretly the Father sees him in the secret chamber and rewards him publicly. And then the third thing is, the Bible says that when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. 
that like to disfigure their face so that they appear unto men fast. But instead, anoint your head with oil. Do it secretly. And your father that sees you do it secretly will reward you openly. There's the promise of reward. Someone said, well, I don't think that you should uh, expect to be rewarded. Well, sure you do. Everything we do, from the Lord, do for the Lord as under the Lord, we realize that he says that he will not owe us. Everything that we do for him, he will reward us. He has promised that. Some in this life and some in the world that is to come, but he certainly says he will reward us 30-fold, 60-fold, even 100-fold in this life. And then after this life, eternal life. He's a rewarder. Do you believe he's a rewarder? The scripture says he is. Do you believe he's a rewarder? The Bible says that he rewards us sometimes 30-fold, sometimes 60-fold, sometimes 100-fold. And you might wonder how come that happens that way. Now, the, the, um, the illustration here from the sixth chapter of Matthew talks about giving and praying and fasting and that God will reward you. When you do those things, the Bible says the Father will reward you. And so I think that you can see there is an accumulative value. If you pray only, if you fast only, if you give only, you, can, you will be rewarded. The Bible says God's a rewarder. But you can expect 30-fold return, reward for the soul, the soul, the seeds that you've sown into that particular work. But if you do two of those together, if you'd, if you'd give and pray, or if you'd pray and fast, or if you'd give and fast, two of those together, there is a, a cumulative effect where you can anticipate not a 30-fold, but you're really anticipating a 60-fold return. Or if you would give and pray and fast, then you would anticipate the 100-fold blessing that would come back in life. God's a rewarder. How many believe he is? Amen. I say God is a rewarder by his very nature, so there is a rate of return. Now, I have uh, shared these things to bring him this. This was just a real, you know, I kind of maybe deceived you a little bit. I told you you're going to have two sermons. You are going to have two messages, but this was really an elongated announcement. Back in uh, January of uh, this year, 2012, we began the year by encouraging our, the members of our congregation to join us 21 days, starting the year, 21 days of fasting. And um, we talked about fasting for a good while. Um, there are people that, that really have uh, shallow or no understanding of what it means to seek the Lord with fasting. And I will grant you that a 21-day fast would be impossible from a physical standpoint to some people because of physical limitations, medical problems or people that are working an extremely physically taxing job may find it impossible to go completely without food for 21 days. And uh, so we talked a great deal last year about that. In fact, is we took a study that took us through most of the uh, summer on Wednesday nights dealing with what it was to fast. And so I'm just going to today give you a uh, overview and more information will be coming. But we're really going to challenge everyone that will to participate in a fast in January of 2013, 21 days. We're, at, we're going to encourage you to fast with us together. And um, there'll be more taught about this, be more said about it. But to give you the idea, we are really going to try to challenge everyone to make a commitment to, to participate in some level of a 21-day fast. And some of us are going to be fasting the whole 21 days completely without food. Others may have a modified diet, such as what they, a lot of these places call a Daniel's fast. We'll have information about that that you can follow that if you'd like. Some people have fasted a meal a day. 
or some people just one or two days a week during the three weeks of the 21-day fast. But we are going to help you participate if you'll commit to do it. And, and I believe that everyone can find a way to participate at some level. And I believe that this is important. Listen, this last year's first what time we've done it. I've been hearing people do about it. To be honest with you, I haven't been very impressed with churches that have started out the year with 21-day fast. They were doing Daniel's fast. I, get around, and I, just, I just wasn't very impressed. But I, I felt differently about it last year. I felt as we uh, prepared for the fast, we got involved in it, uh, that first of all, I believe that many people were able to participate at that level, that say Daniel's fast. We wouldn't have been involved otherwise. And I think that we have seen that there's certainly been a church-wide benefit and there have been individual benefit of people that have joined us in that season of fast. And, of course, people have continued to fast uh, through the year. It's just really been a tremendous thing. And so um, we'll make it possible for everyone to, to participate. We're going to enlist as many as we can people who will commit. Now, I'm bringing this to you this way today because, as you people know that have uh, been part of our church, some of you for many, many years, some of you have been uh, in this church longer than I have. That's a long time. And uh, some of you have been here ever since I pastored the church. And you know that I'm very careful about saying, God spoke to me. And when I tell you God spoke to me, I don't mean that I ate pepperoni pizza too late at night and had a dream that was kind of crazy. I mean that God spoke to me. And this last week, we've been talking to Delana about how we're going to promote the concept of fast. This is not a new idea. We've been thinking about coming back with a second year that we would ask people to join us for 21 days fast, starting the new year off. This week, God spoke to me. And he said to me that we should um, involve as many people, this congregation, we can in this 21-day fast at some level. Some will fast a meal a day. Some will fast a couple of days a week. And some may fast the entire time. Many will probably get involved with a Daniel's fast and, and, uh, and uh, recognize that for the three weeks. But if we do that and, and proportionate to the way that the church responds to this, God's going to make the people of this church, even the ones that don't fast. And that's all right. You know what? Someone say, you know, we ought, to get the, we ought to get the blessing if we're the ones that do the fasting. You know what? This is a blessing on the ministry, the church. And even people that maybe come and join us during this next year after the first month is over, we're going to find that they are happier. The people of the church are going to be happier as a result of this fast. They're going to be healthier. Our people are going to face less physical problems. There's going to be healings. There's going to be cases of divine health. The folks that have been sick are going to get well. And, there's going to, and we're going to be wealthier. Now, that does not promise that everyone here is going to join Forbes' list of billionaires in this country. But we're going to do better in that area, if we will seek the Lord this way. I'm asking you to get involved with us. I'm asking you to make your plans. You will not fast 21 days by accident. Did you hear what I just said? That was important. You will not fast 21 days by accident. You will have to start planning. You'll need to start planning now. You have to get on your calendar, see which days you're going to fast, or if you're going to fast the entire time. You have to make arrangements in your scheduling to be able to accommodate this. If you're going to do the Daniels fast, you do more planning than anybody else because even though you're eating every day, what you eat is so uh, restricted that you'll have to make plans now to get your menus to, to coincide with that. So I'm asking you, I'm, 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 I'm beseeching you now, make your plans. You're going to be involved in this 21 days of fasting that's going to bring happiness, Health, prosperity, 
And this is the thing that I've been really praying about. We've had a number of people in the church that have been praying about this for months. That there needs to be a sense of conviction on people's heart. When people come into the service that do not know the Lord, they need to be aware of their need of Jesus. They need to be aware of their need to repent. People cannot be saved until they know they need to be saved. And we've been praying for some while that God would send a spirit of conviction to this church. That, that we would walk in conviction. And that when people come and join, come into a service, that they will be aware of their need of Jesus. That God will speak to them in that kind of a way. And, and the Lord has put in my heart that if we will as a church fast, proportionately as to how we observe this fast, we're going to see a new wave of the power of conviction and people being truly born again, <laughs> repenting of sins and getting right with God. It's going to take place. 2013 is going to be a great year and it's going to begin in this way and we want you to make plans to join us in it. Now, that was message number one. I've got a very short message number two, but I believe it's equally important and they... These two go together. I want to read to you from the book of 2 Peter. You can turn there with me if you'd like to. 2 Peter is a very short book. You've got to kind of know where you're going to get there. 2 Peter, and we're reading from chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 says, beginning with verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and conduct, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes here. I, um, I would uh, recall several conversations that we've had in, uh, in, the, in recent months, and people's mind is on the coming of the Lord. Um, you, you talk to people about politics, and not that that's a really good conversation, but it's one that comes up quite a bit these days. And um, what I hear people saying is, you know what? I believe that whatever happens in this election is going to, is going to be a, a, a stepping stone in moving us along to fulfilling the prophecies of the last days. That what happens, and in talking about this next week's election, is going to set the stage for the next big event prophetically. And I believe that there's some truth to that. People's mind is on the end time, the coming of the Lord, the end of the age. You know, uh, there was a lot of publicity, and I've even heard some Bible prophecy teachers talk about, and I always get this wrong. It was, I believe... The Incas that supposedly they found, is that right, the Incas? They found their calendar and it runs out about December of this year. The Mayas. They're, they're Central American Indians, the Mayans. And um, so they, they have, uh, they have uh, run a calendar and they ran out in uh, December of 2012. Well, folks, I, I, I don't want to disillusion anybody, but I went back through some of my old files. I have calendar after calendar, and every one of them runs out. Get all excited because their calendar ran out? Now, let me tell you the truth these people that think that that was an indication that, that the world was going to end, two things you should know. Number one, Jesus said 
No man knows the day or the hour when I will return. Then he said, the angels don't know when I will return. And then he said, I don't even know when I'm coming back. The father's kept it in his own power. I get all kinds of theological people cross their eyes at me when I say this, but I believe that God has amnesia. I believe he's got complete control of what he knows. Some said, if, he's, if Jesus is God, he knows. Listen, he said he don't know. He said the angels don't know, men don't know, I don't know, the Father knows. And you say, I think that's impossible. Well, I say, you just don't know. Jesus, or rather the prophet said that God has taken our sins and buried them in the depths of God's forgetfulness. And if I've done anything wrong, I know it. I promise you my wife knows it. <laughs> and you may know it. But God don't know it. There's things that he don't know and he don't know them on purpose. And that applies to this. Jesus said, men don't know, angels don't know, I don't know. The Father's kept it in his own power. And the Mayas don't know it either. Amen. That's number one. Number two is people that think that the world may end when the calendar runs out don't even understand prophecy anyway. There will be a rapture. There will be seven years tribulation. There will be a thousand year millennial reign of Christ. All that before it's over. Their calendar is off by a good thousand years anyway. Don't be incompetent. Say, I know that the end time is on us. I don't know when it is. That's on purpose. God did that on purpose. God didn't tell us when Jesus was coming back. On told us that he was coming back. But did not tell us when and that's on purpose. And the reason is so that we, every one of us, We'll keep pressing toward the mark till we get to the end of the journey. Yes. We're never supposed to stop. We keep pressing in. We keep pressing in until Jesus comes again. So what manner of people should we be since we believe with all of our heart that we're coming to the end? Let me, let me, let me tell you what Jesus said to his disciples. They were saying, when are you, when are you coming back? What is the, what is the sign when the temple will be destroyed? When is the sign when the great days of trouble will come? And when are you coming back? We want to know three things. And Jesus said, first of all, signs that pertain when the temple will be destroyed. There are people yet today preach about the end time, and they're using the same signs that Jesus used to tell when the temple was going to be destroyed. That was 1,900 years ago. It's already been fulfilled. We're not looking at those signs anymore. That pointed to the destruction of the temple. It's already happened. But the signs that point to the return of Jesus have to do with the rising of what we often call the tribulation period. When you see that day coming, you know that the coming of the Lord is before that. Now, here's what I wanted to share with you. Jesus said, when you see the fig tree or all the tree that puts forth its leaf and buds, you say, well, spring is coming. And he said, even so, when you see these signs begin to come to pass, you'll know that my return is coming. And then he said this, when these things began, everyone say began. Yes. When these things began to come to pass, that generation will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of your time today. I'm just going to tell you this. If you've got any question about it, I will assure you that those things have begun to come to pass. Whether you want to talk about the return of Israel to the homeland, or if you want to talk about 1948 when Israel became a nation again. Or if you want to talk about 1967 when Jerusalem became part of the property of Israel. Or if you want to talk about 1981 when Israel declared that Jerusalem will be their eternal indivisible capital. I don't know which point you want to say. But I'm telling you today those things have begun to come to pass. They have started 
And now I'm going to tell you that this generation that we're part of today will not pass away till everything has been fulfilled. Some of us may go by way of the grave, but those of us that live a normal life can certainly expect that we will see the sign of Jesus coming in the clouds. We are in what I like, love to call the earmarked generation. He's coming in our time. It's coming. It's going to happen. So what kind of people should we be? First of all, Jesus said that we should watch and pray always that we might be counted worthy to escape the days of trouble that will come upon the entire world. Some people believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation, seven years of heartache and suffering such as the world has never seen before. Others believe, well, no, we won't go through all of it, but the first half of it. They, they call the people that believe we're going to go all through it. They call those people post-tribulation theologists. Those people that believe we're going to go halfway, three and a half years into the tribulation, they call those people mid-trib. I am not mid-trib, and I am so not post-trib. I don't even like post-toasties. I'm so not post-trib. I believe that the next thing that we're going to see is the sign of the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory. I believe the rapture is the next thing upon the horizon. And what Jesus says is, whatever you want to believe about that, you deal with that. I'm telling you that the Scripture seems to indicate for certain that in our generation, Jesus is coming again. And knowing that, we need to live our life in such a way that Jesus spoke of that we should watch and pray always that we may be counted worthy to escape the day of trouble that will come upon the entire world. We need to watch and pray. Someone says, well, what's the requirement for going in the rapture? Jesus said, watch and pray. We need to stay fervent. The reason we don't know the day is because there's some people that try to wait to the last minute before they get right. Jesus said, don't do it that way. He said, watch and pray always. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. One time I had a guy that was preaching a, a series of sermons. He said, come to church a certain night. I'm going to tell you exactly when Jesus is coming. House was full of people. He got up and he said, Jesus said in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man comes. The minute you give up and quit waiting, quit looking, that's when he's going to come. The person that's not going to make it is a guy that's trying to wait to the last and get in. But let those people that are going to be wise stay ready every day looking forward to hasting into the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we need to stay ready. Watch and pray. Secondly, we need to encourage one another. I don't know if you realize it, but the day about us is a day of trouble. Iniquity is abounding. But I thank God where iniquity abounds, grace does much more abound. Can you say amen? amen. In this day, we need the help of brothers and sisters to stay ready and be on our guard. We need to be speaking words of encouragement. Quit criticizing, folks, and tell people the words that will cause them to stand up on their feet. Can you say amen? You see somebody overtaken by a fault, get your heel on their head and push them down in the mud. No, said if you find somebody overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one as that. In a spirit of meekness, consider, considering yourself, lest you should also stumble. We need to be encouraging one another in these words, in these days. These are the end time. Satanic activity in these days. I believe there's more overt than it has ever been. Satanic temptation. People are being drugged off to do things that are wrong. You know, in the beginning when Adam and Eve were being tempted with only one thing, don't eat of this one tree. The old devil was very subtle. The Bible says he was more subtle than any other creature. Took on the form of a serpent. Spoke to Eve. Has God told you not to eat from this tree? Did he say that you'd die? Very slick, you know, very slithering, very tricky and deceptive. I don't believe the devil's nearly that way these days so much. I believe he comes right in your face. I believe he, believe he puts a temptation right in front of people. He, he's become very daring in these days. We need the Christian brotherhood to stand up together. Amen. We need to be provoking one another to good works in these days. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We're going to make it, but we're going to make it together. Can you say amen? amen? And so in these days, we're going to help one another. Also, you know, also in, in the realm of satanic activity is false religions. 
I, I heard about false religions when I was a kid growing up, you know, in the church. I've, I've been in church all my life. I was growing up in church. They talk about false religion, and they're talking about devil worship, you know. There were seances, and there was voodoo. And those things are real. They still probably take place today. What concerns me is how many folks today are taken off on other false religions. We, we have, and I will not go into the uh, speaking of the names of them, but there are churches that have been uh, publicized, their, their, their ministries on television, te you know, television, te televangelists. And in order to try to prop up their numbers, they've tried to open their doors to Islamic worship along with Christian worship. Let me just make one plant thing straight. I'm not at war. We don't try to overtake Islam by war. We don't try to fight with them. We don't try to arm wrestle them. <laughs> we, we, just, we just believe Jesus Christ. We believe in salvation is no other name but his name. We preach it. We believe it. We live it. And, and, and we simply do the ministry of Jesus Christ on the earth. We don't fight people. But we're mistaken. If you think Allah and Jehovah are the same person, you are a fool. I said you are a fool. You are lost if you believe that. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That name is Jesus. I said that name is Jesus and we have no concord with darkness. We've got no fellowship with, with the devil. All right, that having been said, that is scary enough to think that there are churches that are trying to combine Christianity with, with Islam which is absolutely an abomination. But what's very difficult is in these days, people that call themselves Christian, but they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. They do not believe that he was the creator of all things. They do not believe in his vicarious death and his victorious resurrection. And those religions, they may call themselves Christian, but they are as damning as Islam, as Buddhas, as Hindus, it's a false religion. It's a doctrine of devils. That's why the church has got to stand together. That's why we have to be bold in proclaiming the truth and we've got to, to, store, uh, to shore each other up. Together we can stand on this firm foundation. We cannot live, leave room for doctrine of devils. I, I want to tell you this, and then I'm through today. I, I have mentioned before, years ago when they were showing videos on TV, that someone is taken with a camcorder, old-fashioned camcorder. They had shown a bridge in uh, San Francisco that had fallen. And somebody was standing over the camera taking videos of cars that were driving off that bridge into San Francisco Bay. And, and then some idiot news agency paid them money. That's what they did it for, was for money. Paid them money to take their video and, and broadcast it on the news. And I think they should have taken that man, whoever it was, or woman, whoever did it, and arrested them. Instead of stopping the cars, yes. they went up and took videos of people falling into the, the, the San Francisco Bay. But I want to tell you we're no better if we know the hour that we're living in and without any resistance. I know if people are bound to go into eternity without God, you cannot make them. But certainly we can warn them. And certainly we have an obligation. Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. He said, I am a debtor. Listen. If I preach the gospel to someone that's lost, it's because I owe them a debt to share with them the truth. If a person goes into eternity without God because they decide to go into eternity without God, then that's their decision. But if they go into eternity without God because I didn't tell them that I'm a debtor, it's my responsibility. If I believe that Jesus is coming, coming soon, coming in any moment, and I do, then it should cause me to stand in the road and wave a flag and try to turn someone that is 
on their way off a bridge that's broken down and going off into eternity without God. That should be what we're doing. If we believe these are the last days, that's what we should be doing if we're living in a day that we believe is hastening into the coming day of God. Stand with me, please, everyone in this place.